Moving on, subcostally, we discussed before, we can also see the fifth chamber. So the aortic valve, the LVOT seen over here and here the aortic valve. You simply have to tilt more to the beam of the transducer. The transducer is looking more cranially. And here you see that there is the aortic valve. You lose a little bit of sight of the left atrium, but you get a very nice view of how the valve is opening. Also in this case, you can take a look if there's pericardial effusion present and you might think that here is a bit of free fluid. Overall, in this case, it's definitely not pathological. So also in this view, you can evaluate the heart if there is a relevant pericardial effusion present. So this specific patient presented with dyspnea and more signs and symptoms of heart failure. And there is a very, very localized pericardial effusion around the left ventricle and also the left atrium. You can see it even better in this five chamber view. So this is even a little bit of an over rotation from the five chamber view. And additional features here include this septal bounce. So there is a septal bouncing. This actually turned out to be constrictive pericarditis. And the first views you can get in this patient already from a subcoastal approach, which show you, even though it's in the far field, a pericardial, a localized pericardial effusion, and this weird movement of the interventricular septum called septal bounds. So this is a point of care setting. This patient had several infections, also tuberculosis and a pericardial effusion due to the infection and indeed ended up having constrictive pericarditis. Now there are some more views we have to take a look into. So the subcoastal short axis view, for example, is something you do not want to miss. From the subcoastal four chamber view, you simply rotate counterclockwise so that the mark of the transducer points towards the left shoulder of the patient. And if you're in the right imaging plane, you can get a subcoastal approach from the short axis. So this looks like the peristonal short axis, just you perform this view from a subcoastal approach. You see the tricuspid valve, the right ventricle, RVOT, pulmonic valve, and here the pulmonic trunk and even the pulmonic arteries. This is an optimal image where you can see the interatrial septum, the left atrium, the right atrium, the tricuspid valve, the right ventricle, the RVOT. Here you see the pulmonic valve, the pulmonic trunk, and the right and the left pulmonary artery. So with this view, you can have a really nice overview. You even see that the aortic valve is tricuspid. You can even measure here, for example, with the pulse wave Doppler, the pulmonary acceleration time. So this is an important view, especially if the peristonal views are not possible or if they are not that good. So from this subcoastal approach, you really can differentiate that the aortic valve is tricuspid, the right coronary, the A coronary and the left coronary cusp is seen. If you have a pulmonary embolism, you can sometimes even visualize it directly from this subcoastal approach. Additionally, when you start at the aortic valve, you can move and tilt the transducer. So it's actually more the tilting from the aortic valve towards the apex. So as you would tilt the transducer in the peristonal short axis, you can tilt the transducer in the subcostal short axis as well. You can move from the aortic valve to the mitral valve, visualize as seen here the tricuspid valve, the pulmonic valve, the pulmonary arteries, the right ventricle, the interatrial septum, the RVOT. You can see if there is pulmonic stenosis present, pulmonary regurgitation. You can use it for shunt calculation as you would do it with the QPQS in the peristonal views and for the left ventricle with the apical views. You can even look for warm motion abnormalities if you have then the optimal view towards the left ventricle from the subcostal approach. It's simply the same as you would do it peristernally. Here are some examples where you see a calcified but not stenotic aortic valve. Also, the aortic root seems borderline. There is an extra systole, ventricular extra systole, the RVOT, the pulmonic valve, and this dilatation of the pulmonic trunk and the right and the left pulmonary artery are also dilated. The left atrium from this approach also seems dilated. Of course, you need the other views to really quantify, but Again, you get a lot of information out of these views. You can use M mode as well in this situation. So you can even see the aortic box in the center of the image and you can even visualize the tricuspid valve. So from the subcoastal approach, you can do basically what you want. 
The one important thing you have to be aware of is the angle. So in this case, you want to measure the pulmonary acceleration time and the signal of the RVOT and after the pulmonic valve, you want to place the pulse wave Doppler, but if there is the angle which is not optimal, you will not get accurate signals. So always be aware that the angle should be as optimal as possible, because if you do not have the optimal angle, the signals you get will be simply not true. In this case, you have truly a dilatation of the aortic root. Still, this is a subcostal short axis view. And if you tilt the transducer quarterly, you do see here the left ventricle, here the papillary muscles. Before there was even a mitral valve. So from the mitral valve towards the left ventricle, starting from the aortic valve, you can visualize all the structures of the left ventricle from the aortic valve, LVOT, to the mitral valve, to the papillary muscles, to the apex. Also, additionally, you can see that the tricuspid valve sometimes is even shown tricuspid in this view. And also you can see more structures of the right ventricle. Sometimes it is even possible if there is an optimal alignment of tricuspid regurgitation to measure the pulmonary arterial pressures. Very often that won't be possible because as in this case, the continuous wave Doppler is not optimally aligned. So it's always a guessing game what you're actually measuring. But if you have the optimal signal with an optimal curve, you can even try to measure it from this subcoastal approach. Focusing on the left ventricle, you see those two loops over here, where you again can look for, for example, warm motion abnormalities and overall radial function of the ventricle.